In the last video, we took some time, a lot of time, to carefully go ahead and derive the formula that you see up here at the top of the page for how to find the surface area of one of our solids of revolution. Now, it's so important, again, for me to emphasize to you that understanding that video, watching what we're doing there, is crucial to understanding what's happening. Obviously, I could have just given you this formula and asked you to start working with it, but there's a reason why I made that last video. I'm not here to waste your time. You probably have existed in so many other classes where you're just, I don't know, told formulas, right? Random formulas just appear on a board and someone says, please use this, and you have no idea why or how it works. This class cannot and will not ever be one of those classes, because in order to understand what you're doing, you have to understand where certain ideas come from. In fact, what we're going to see is that the key to understanding this section, the key to understanding even this video here, will be to go back and to rethink about the frustums that are going to be uh, able to be visualized when we look at these solids of revolution. It's also the only way we can understand our conditions. Remember here, the start of this definition, we had two conditions on our function f of x. One, it had to have a continuous derivative. We saw that was important because we needed to use the mean value theorem up above to simplify down to this nice simple radical. The thing that we didn't quite look at was the fact that we needed a non-negative function. Remember what that would have meant is that my function would have had to exist above the x-axis. So that would mean that my f of xk minus 1 and my f of xk could actually represent the lengths of these radii. Notice that if my function was beneath the x-axis, then f of those values would produce a negative number, which would not be the length of the radii. And so it's extremely important that we have a non-negative function so that our f of xk star can ultimately end up representing the length of those radii. It's also important that I understand the last video because it's the only way in my mind I can easily remember why what I have here actually matches up uh, or, or actually computes for me the uh, surface area that I desire. So I'm going to go ahead and just jot down a couple notes here in this definition so we can try to summarize everything that we saw from the last video. So again, if I have a function that's non-negative and continuous, then I can define the surface area of the solid by taking my curve, and notice here, rotating around the x-axis, then I can say that that surface area is given by my 2 pi, my f of x, my 1 plus, my f prime of x squared dx. Now again, notice here I should be able to see that frustum formula. Remember that frustum formula was that pi times radius 1 plus radius 2 times the length. And I can see my length right here. That's my arc length formula. And my two radii, well, they ended up being the same thing over a small interval. And so we had two f of x's as opposed to two different r's being added. If I know this and understand this, I can see it popping out here. Now, it's also possible that this could be rewritten in a couple of different ways. And this is what I note down below. Note here that I could take my 2 pi as a constant, and I could pull it out of the radical. No big changes there. I could also note this very important idea. y and f of x are the same thing. We stated that right up here. And so there's nothing wrong with taking this um, f of x here and replacing it with the value of y. It looks weird. I would never want to leave it in this form if I was going to evaluate the integral with respect to x, but it is still correct. The other thing that I could do is I could take this back portion here that I'll underline in blue, and I'll notice that again, that looks like my arc length formula, but multiplied by dx. Of course, that's the same as what we talked about at the end of the last section, where ds represents the arc length differential. And so oftentimes you'll see arc length when rotating around an or sorry, uh, surface area, when rotating around an x-axis, being uh, uh, communicated by this integral here. Notice that the bounds are left off um, because it's totally possible that we may uh, not be sure of if we want to compute this yet as a dx or a dy integral, but more on that in a moment. Now, what we'll also be able to see here 
when we take a look at this is that there is a way that we could pretend the or imagine rewriting uh, this given integral here as a dy integral. What we would have to be able to do is to take our red function y equals f of x and rewrite it as an x equals function. We'd also have to imagine our our curve existing over some range of y values like c to d. And then notice that I can go ahead and make the change to surface area by using the following integral. I could say that my surface area would be given by integrating from c to d and I'm going to start over here with my arc length piece. Notice that my arc length piece would then have to change to look something like this. Notice this is exactly how I would change things over if I was just doing an arc length question. Now if I want to change the rest of the integral, the 2 pi doesn't need much switching, but the f of x does need to switch. If I want this to be an easy to evaluate function, I need to do a fair trade on all of these pieces. So what is f of x equivalent to? Well, it's equivalent to y. And so again, I'm getting this y piece in here automatically from uh, this substitution that I make up here. So this is how I could take a surface area integral when revolving around the x-axis and modify it to become an integral that uh, can be done with respect to y. I'll summarize those changes one final time. Notice again that my arc length piece switched just like I can normally switch my arc length like we did in the last section several times. And I swapped out my f of x for what f of x was equal to. And that's how I made my change. Now in a very similar way, I could notice that if I was rotating down here around a y-axis, a lot of things would begin to change. Imagine I took a curve, maybe like this, and if I rotated it around the y-axis and then tried to create a 3D solid, you could start to imagine where the frustums are going to be. My frustums would kind of exist in this sort of a position. They'd kind of be stacking on top of each other. And so in that case, I can see that the radii of my frustums would be measured horizontally, the slant height would be measured differently, and so if I move around the y-axis, it's going to be very important that I have a curve that's in the form x equals stuff with y. And the way then that I would measure my surface area here would be measure from c to d, 2 pi. My g of y would help to measure the radius of a frustum. And then I would have my arc length piece that I would measure in terms of y. Oops, and don't forget this is squared. However, I can still compute this surface area, which has vertically stacking frustums, with respect to x, but I would just have to do that by making fair and appropriate changes. First, I would swap out the measure for my arc length. I know that I would have to change that to something with a, uh, I'll say here like a uh, f prime of x squared, if I can rewrite my function in this form, then I would have to swap my arc length to this, and my bounds would change. Notice I'm changing the arc length first. I would still have my 2 pi, that would remain, and I'd have to swap, or swap out this piece, my g of y, and I know that g of y is equivalent to x. So notice that there's kind of this interesting conversion that can happen in each one of these cases. If I'm rotating around the x-axis, my default way of thinking about this is a dx problem, and I can convert to a dy. In a similar way, when rotating around the y-axis, my default setup is a dy, but I can convert to a dx. This is often the part of surface area that people find the most difficult and will take the most practice for you to get used to. But the key to getting it is to actually understand everything from the last video. You have to be able to see the frustums. You have to understand how we're measuring them. If you can't see the frustums, then these will just always look like four random formulas that you will very, uh, have a very difficult time attempting to understand. In the next video, we'll start to take a look at some specific examples and see how we can set up integrals in both of these sorts of approaches.